Hello, everyone. Welcome back from spring break. I hope you're all doing well, and I hope you could use a little break from school. Uh, today, we're going to do some examples from chapter number six. Um, remember, uh, when we last discussed a, a chapter, it was chapter five. We defined what a random variable is. That is when we associate numerical values to each outcome of an event, and we assign a probability to each one of those. And in chapter five, we only worked with discrete random variables. Now in chapter six, we're going to work with continuous random variables. And basically, most of what we're going to do in chapter six is normal distribution. There are another couple of things or normal distribution with a twist. Uh, so it's basically normal distribution. Uh, so I want to show you how to work through some of the exercises. Uh, so give me one second, please. And I will share my screen. Share screen. Share screen. Good. Okay, so section 6.1, we are going to introduce two continuous um, probability distributions, which are uniform and normal. Uh, uniform is new. Normal distribution we have discussed before, uh, but let's just start with this question from a uniform distribution. Remember, a uniform distribution means that all the values are equally likely. So the graph of this distribution is a rectangle. And remember that we cannot just do what we did before for a discrete random variable. When we wanted to find probability of some events in discrete random variables, we found the probability of each one of those, and then we added them together. Now, since we are working in the continuous case, there are infinitely many of those. So we cannot do that anymore. What we're going to do is we're going to find the area corresponding to the probability, the area uh, under the curve. And that's how we're going to calculate probabilities in this chapter. Um, okay, so let's take a look at this problem. A statistics professor plans classes so carefully that the lengths of her classes are uniformly distributed between 50 and 52 minutes. Find the probability that a given class period runs between 50.25 and 51 minutes. So the first thing we need to do is draw our graph. Oh, I thought I had it. I thought I had it here. It must be, oh, it's right here. Uh, so remember the graph is a rectangle. We know in this case, we go from 50 to 52. That's where the rectangle starts. This is where the rectangle ends. And we need to find the length of the base of this rectangle. Um, how do we do that? We simply subtract the two and we get that this base is equal to two. Also remember that the total probability is always going to equal one. We know this since chapter four. So whatever area is in this rectangle has to be equal to one. Uh, so we have one variable. We don't know what the height is, but it has to be a number such that when we multiply it by the length of the base, our result is one. So we can come up with this equation right here. We know that one equals the area, which is the base times height. We know the base is two. So two times h equals one. We solve this equation and we find that h has to equal one half or 0 0.5. So we found the height of this rectangle. We know the dimensions of this total rectangle. Now that we have that, we need to find the probability that they are asking us to find. We want to find the probability that the time is between 50.25 and 51. So that means that we want to find a smaller rectangle that starts at 50.25 and 
and it ends at 51. So you can see it here in blue, this is our smaller rectangle. Again, we need to find the length of the base of this rectangle. We simply subtract the two sides. So we get 0 0.75. We found already that the height of this rectangle is 0 0.5. And we know that to find the area of a rectangle, we, we multiply uh, the base times the height. So this is 0 0.75 times 0 0.5. And that is 0 0.375. And that is the probability. So let's put in. Good. Uh, we are not going to discuss this distribution any further. That's basically all we're going to do. So now let's move on to normal distribution. We have talked about normal distribution. We know the shape is a bell-shaped distribution, it's symmetric. And this is a standard normal distribution, which means that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So how do we find the area uh, that's highlighted here? Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use a table. You can find this table online. You can just Google uh, normal distribution table. It's also uh, at the end of the textbook. It's in Appendix A, I believe. You can also find it here on the notes uh, for Chapter 6, Table A2. All right here. And also, many times, you are going to... Oh, where is my... Where is my pop-up band? Oh, did I lose it? I think I lost it. That's okay. Let me access again. Uh, we are working on section 6.1. Section 6.1 preview. We are working on question number 10. So as I was saying, there are many ways to access this table. And in many of these questions, you're going to have uh, a link to see the table right here. So let's let's do that. This is the table. Uh, now, how did I know that I wanted to go to the page two? Because the page two is positive test, uh, positive z-scores, and page number one is negative z-scores. And here we're given a C-score of 0 0.22, which is positive. So what we're going to do is we're going to first find the row of the probability we're looking for. And that is going to be the integer and the first decimal. So I'm going to go to the table and look for 0 0.2. It's right here. It's the third row on the table. So this is the row that my value is in. And how do I know which one to choose? That's what the last decimal is for. That's how I'm going to choose the column. So since this is 0 0.22, I want the 0 0.2 row and the 0 0.02 column. So this must be 0 0.5871. 0 0.5871 should be the right answer. And that's all we do. We need to check what the z-score is. We go to our table, we identify the row and the column, and that value is the area to the left of this z-score. Good, uh, let's move on to question 11, which is basically the same, but notice that now we want the area to the right. And my table only gives me the area to the left. Uh, also notice we don't have a table here. I think I'm going to have to open one here and I hope it doesn't close this again. Oh, I don't know why it does that. Bear with me, please. I'm going to open the 
assignment once again. Six point one preview. Yes. Okay, so we want to go to question 11. So we're looking for the area to the right. And remember that our table gives us the area to the left. So what do we do? We use the complement proof. We know that we can find the area to the left by looking at the table. So once we find that, we subtract that from one, right? So this area is going to be one minus the area to the left of negative 0 0.95. So that is over here. Remember negative 0 0.95, we look for the row first, negative 0 0.9, which is down here. I hope you can see my mouse, it's right here. And the column is, uh, corresponds to the last decimal, which is 0 0.5. So in this case, it's 0 0.1711, because that is the column of 0 0.05 and the row of negative 0 0.9. So 0 0.1711. Remember, this is the area to the left, so we need to subtract from 1. We always make sure we have the right amount of decimals. In this case, it's four. And we got it. So remember, be careful. If it's the area to the left, you simply take the number from the table. If it's the area to the right, you subtract from one. And now let's do number 12. Here, we don't have like to the left or to the right. We have actually an area between two C scores. So what we do is we subtract the area to the left of each because the area to the left of 1.25 is all this. So if we take away this area to the left of negative 0 0.96, we are left with the area we are looking for. So first, let's find the area to the left of 1.25. We do the same thing we did before. We look for the 1.2 row, 0 0.5 column, that is 0.9944. Did I say 99.44? I think I said 89.44. And then we subtract the area to the left of negative 0 0.96 be up here, so negative 0 0.9, and then row 6, 0.1685. So we need to subtract these two areas, and we will get the area between the two z-scores. 0.7255. Check the right amount of decimals, and we got it. And these are the only three possible cases we could have. If it's to the left, we copy the number from the table. If it's to the right, we subtract from one. And if it's in between, we get the two areas to the left, and we subtract them one from the other. And now let's do question 28. So notice for all the previous problems, the last three problems we did with normal distributions, we were given the z-score and we had to find the corresponding probability. Now we're going backwards. Now we are given the probability, in this case it's 0 0.8770, and we need to find the z-score. So we need to kind of like reverse engineer it. Uh, we know this is going to be a positive z-score because it's to the right of zero. So we need to look at the page two of the table. 
So now since we're going backwards, what we need to do is we need to find this number, 0 0.8770 in the body of the table. So we do that, takes a little bit of time. We want to find the number closest to it. Not all numbers are in the table. If the exact number is not here, we want the number that is closest to it. In this case, 0 0.8770 is on the table. So we need to identify what row and what column. We can see that in this case, this is in the row 1.1 and in the column 0 0.06. So we combine them. And that means that the z-score is 1.16. And that's it. I hope this was clear. This is all I wanted to show you from this section. So now let's move on to section 6.2. Okay, so in section 6.2, we are working with normal distribution only. We're not working with uniform anymore. But now this is not a standard distribution. Now this is a non-standard normal distribution. That means that the either the mean is not zero or the standard deviation is not one or, or both. Um, so what we're going to do is we want to transform our non-standard normal distribution into a standard normal distribution. And remember, we do that by calculating the z-score. Uh, so this is kind of like an extra step we do first. And then we do exactly the same thing we did in section 6.1. So let me show you question three. Find the area of the shaded region, the graph to the right depicts IQ scores of adults, and those scores are normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So here we have the graph. Uh, we don't know the z-score, but we know the x value of 95. So let's find the z-score first. We know the z-score is going to be x minus the mean over the standard deviation. So the x value in this case is 95. We subtract the mean, which is 100. And then we divide by the standard deviation, which is 15. And we get our corresponding z-score, which is negative 0.33. And once we have our z-score, it's exactly the same thing we did before. Uh, we know this is a negative z-score, so we take a look at page number one. And we want the area to the left, because that is the shaded region. So we look for the probability in the column, uh, in the row of negative 0 0.3, and in the row of 0 0.03. And that's the probability that we are looking for. So let's do that. We go to the table. We are looking for the row... In this case, we can find the column first, 0 0.03. So this is the column we want. We can scroll down to negative 0 0.3. And the probability is 0 0.3707. So the probability is 0 0.3707. That is our final answer. And we got it. So notice we did the same thing. We have to use the table. But there's an extra step in the beginning. We need to transform our non-standard normal distribution into a standard normal distribution. And that's it. Let me show you 16, where it's kind of like the opposite, right? We are given a probability, and we want to find the corresponding value. Engineers want to design seats in commercial aircraft so that they are wide enough to fit 99% of all males. Accommodating 100% of males would require very wide seats that would be much too expensive. 
Men have hip bras that are normally distributed with a mean of 14.8 inches and a standard deviation of 0 0.8 inches. Find P99. That is, find the hip breadth for men that separates the smallest 99% from the largest 1%. So we do the same, the same thing we did in exercise 28 in section 6.1. We go to the body of the table. We want to find that 0 0.9900, and we need to identify the row and the column to find the corresponding z-score. So let's do that. I have it right here. Uh, we know it's over 0 0.5, so it's going to be in the positive uh, portion of the table. We're looking for 0.99, which I think it's right here. 0.9901 is the closest. This is in the row 2.3 and in the column 0.03. So that should be a z-score of 2.33. But notice we are not done yet. This is the z-score, but now we need to transform this z-score to the corresponding x value. And there is a formula for that. Remember that x is the mean plus the z-score multiplied by the standard deviation. So in this case, the mean is 14.8 plus the z-score that we found, which is 2.33, times the standard deviation, which we are given 0 0.8. So let's find this. 14.8 plus 2.33 times 0.8, which is 16.66. We want to round to one decimal place as needed at the end, so that should be 16.7. And that's it. Uh, so again, notice uh, that exercises like this section, uh, question three and question 16, we're doing basically the same thing, but there's like an extra step because we have to transform the z-score to the x value or vice versa. Okay. It's pretty much the same thing. That's what I wanted to show you from section 6.2. Section 6.3 is different. Um, we are not doing many calculations in section 6.3. This is just trying to make you understand this concept that we're going to use in section 6.4. So this is only three questions. Uh, question one, uh, here we are asking about what of these statistics are biased or unbiased. Uh, so it's just checking the definitions, selecting all that are unbiased. And then question two and three, we're kind of repeating the same experiment. Um, so I think we're not going to do that here, but let me just like tell you how, how we should do this. For instance, we need, okay, let's read the problem. Three randomly selected children are surveyed. The ages of the children are 1, 4, and 10. So these three numbers, 1, 4, 10, are the population that we have for question 2. Assume that samples of size n equals 2 are randomly selected with replacement from the population of 1, 4, and 10. Listed below are the nine different samples. So we have these three uh, numbers in the population, 1, 4, 10, and we want to take a sample of size 2. That means we are selecting two numbers out of those three. And notice it is with replacement. So we can get one, one. Uh, here they list all of these for us. So we have all the possible outcomes, one, 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 four, one, 10, et cetera. And they're gonna ask us to do some, some stuff. We can start, uh, find the value of the population median. So remember the median is the value that's right in the middle. So what is the value right in the middle between one, four, and 10? In this case, it's four. Good job. And this is like the long part, part B. 
Find the median of each of the nine samples, then summarize the sampling distribution of the medians in the format of a table representing the probability distribution of the distinct median values. So we're going to take these nine pairs of numbers and we're going to find the median in each one of them. And when we do that, we're going to get six different results, okay? Uh, for example, let's do one, four. Uh, remember the median between only two numbers, it's the mean. So we add them together, one plus four divided by two, that is 2.5. So one of these sample medians is going to be 2.5. Now, what is the probability that the sample median is 2.5? We know this is going to be a fraction. Remember chapter four we have nine possible outcomes. So that is our denominator. And then our numerator is how many of these outcomes give us a mean as a sample median of 2.5. So we got that from one and four. Is there any other one that also give us a sample median of 2.5? Yes, there is one other, which is four one. Same two values, but in different order. So we have two. So that is the probability. Okay, and we're gonna do this with all six sample medians. And then we're going to take the mean, the weighted mean of those. Um, so that means, for instance, for, for this first one, let's say the mean is one, this is only one on table. So the probability is one over nine. And then what we're going to do is calculate the weighted mean, that is multiply each one of these sample medians by its probability and then add them all together. And that is going to be the sample mean, sample median mean. And then we're going to compare those two values, four, and then the other value we find. Um, I hope this is helpful. This is only three questions, so I don't really wanna solve the whole thing. Uh, but if you have any 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 questions, please please let me know, and I will be happy to help. So this is section six point three. There's not many. There's not much going on here. Um, but it is important that you do understand what we're doing. So that is all I wanted to show you from section six point three. And then let's do section six point four, which is again basically normal distribution with a twist. Uh, so here we're going to use the central limit theorem. Uh, let me see if I can pull up those slides so that I can show you what this is. So the central limit theorem states that for all samples of the same size and greater than 30 sampling distribution of means can be approximated by a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation, sigma over square root of. Uh, so what is the same? That whenever we have samples and the sample size is greater than 30, we can consider those samples as a normal distribution. And what's the benefit of doing that? That we know how to work with normal distributions. So now we can find probabilities with these sample means. Uh, the mean is going to be the same as the distribution mean, but the standard deviation changes. And now it's going to be the original standard deviation over the square root of n, which is the sample size. Okay, that is the theorem we are applying in section 6.4. So let's do question number five. Yeah, I know. Okay. Assume that females have pulse rates that are normally distributed with a mean of mu equals 72 beats per minute and a standard deviation of sigma equals 12.5 beats per minute. Complete parts A through C below. Part A. If one adult female is randomly selected, find the probability that her pulse rate is less than 75 bits per minute. So this is one random female. That is section 
That is what we have done before. The first thing we need is to find the z-score. We know the z-score is the x value minus the mean over the standard deviation. So in this case, our x value is 75. We subtract the mean, which is 72, and divide by the standard deviation, which is 12.5. So this gives us a result of 0 0.24. Now we want to find a pole trade that is less than that. So less, does that mean to the left or to the right? Less means to the left. So we want to find the probability, the area to the left of these C scores, 0 0.24. So we go back to our table. We go to the row of 0 0.2 and the column of 0 0.04 and we find 59.48. 59.48, that is the probability that we are looking for. Good job. So this is section 6.2. This is the same thing we have done before. Now, notice for part B, if 25 adult females are randomly selected, find the probability that they have pulse rates with a mean less than 75 bits per minute. It seems pretty similar. But now, the way to tell that we need to use the central limit theorem is that we are getting a sample. Now we have 25 adult females. So that's the difference. Part A is only one. Part B is 25. Uh, so the way to find the probability is the same. We first find our C-score, and then we use the table with that C-score we get. But remember that now the way to calculate the Z-score changes a little bit. It is still X minus the mean, but now in the denominator, we have the original standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size, okay? So in this case, we have 75 is the x value. We know the mean is 72. Um, here we have that the original standard deviation is 12.5, and we divide by the square root of the standard deviation, which, I mean, the square root of the sample size, sorry, which is 25. So if we calculate this, we would get 1.2. Okay. Um, and then we find the probability that our, um, we find the area to the left of 1.2. We want it to be to the left because again, we have less. We want to find the probability that the mean is less than 75. So that means we go to the left. So we go back to our table. We look for the Z-score 1.2. So that is in the row 1.2, the column zero, zero. That is 0.8849. And that is the probability. Now, before checking, let me just remind you. Uh, part A is one subject. So that is section 6.2. That's what we did before. Part B is a sample. And we are considering the mean of that sample. That is the keyword we know now we want to use the central limit theorem. So procedure is very similar. We find the z-score, then we find the probability using the table, but the only difference is that now we have these divided by square root of n on the denominator of the z-score, okay? So that's how you tell them apart, and that is what the difference is in each one of them. And then part C, why can't the normal distribution be used in part B, even though the sample size does not exceed 30? Uh, since the distribution of, is of individuals, not sample means, the distribution is a normal distribution for any sample size. That sounds good. Let's take a look at all the other options. Since the original population has a normal distribution, uh, no, that. That is the one I was referring to, sorry. Since the distribution is of sample means, not individuals, the distribution is a normal distribution for any sample size. This is not true. We want to have a sample size of 30 or more. 
since the mean pulse rate exceeds 30, and this is not true because the sample size is 25. So it has to be P. The original distribution is normal. So that is enough. If the original distribution is not normal, we do need a sample size that exceeds 30. Okay. Okay, so I think I think that's it. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And that is that is chapter six, four sections. I think we have a couple of sections that are due this week. And then we're gonna finish next week. We're gonna start chapter seven. Uh, if you have any questions about any of the assignments or your uh, your midterms or anything, please let me know and I'll be happy to help. Have a good one.